everybody. We're going to pull everything back together here and come in for our last panel before lunch. This is going to be a really interesting panel talking about the problems of Porgy and Bess, um, considering issues of race and appropriation and representation um, among some of our uh, university's top scholars um, and about which we are very excited. Um, Willie Sullivan is going to be our moderator and he will introduce everybody to you. Um, but this is going to be a really exciting uh, discussion and here we go. Morning. Morning. I'm going to adjust this mic a little bit. So I'm a little tall. I think that's as good as it gets. Um, <laughs> good morning. My name is Willie Sullivan. I work for the University Musical Society. And I've been working with Jessica and Mark on um, the symposium and uh, some of the different uh, programs and activities that have been happening. And I'm so excited that I'm doing this this morning because. Um, as a former singer myself, Porgy and Bess has always held a special place in my heart. Um, and so getting to dive into some of these other ways of looking at it is really fantastic. So what I want to do, uh, come on up, Daniel. Got our last panelist here. Um, so what I want to do first, um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce who we have here. And, and they'll talk a little bit about their own personal feelings about the piece. And then after that, I'll probably ask one or two questions, but I want to save the bulk of our time, actually, for questions from you all on this topic. So um, I'm going to try to keep us all on task here, all right? Um, so I'm going to start by introducing all of these wonderful people who are up here. And I'm going to start all the way down at the end with uh, Elizabeth James, who is the program manager for the Department of Afro-American and African Studies a third generation storyteller and second generation librarian. She is a National, Count National Center for Institutional Diversity Research to Practice Fellow, whose current project focuses on cross-cultural communication through the art of storytelling. Um, Elizabeth, personally, is a very good, in my opinion, storyteller. Um, she was one of the fantastic narrators of the um, event that went on at UMA a few weeks ago, Out of the Silence, and it was fantastic. Moving on to the uh, right, af right beside Elizabeth, I'm gonna move to Naomi Andre, who is Associate Professor of Women's Studies and Associate Professor of Afro-American and African Studies in LSNA, as well as Associate Director for Faculty at the Residential College. Um, right immediately beside her, I don't wanna say my left or right because I'm like, mine is different than yours, so I say the wrong thing. Um, we have Angela Dillard, who is the Earl Lewis Collegiate Professor of Afro-American and African Studies and in the Residential College. She is currently serving as the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Education for LSNA and spent the first part of the semester teaching a course in LSNA's Applied Liberal Arts Division called Debating Porgy and Bess. Her students are presenting their final team-based poster assignments at today's symposium. So that's those posters that we've all been looking at here and discussing um, are her students, really awesome stuff out there. Right next to her is um, Mark Clegg, who I think we all are familiar with at this point, um, who is Associate Professor of Musicology at the School of Music, Theater, and Dance, and the director of the U of M Gershwin Initiative. He currently serves as the interim Associate Dean of the School of Music, Theater, and Dance. And lastly, we have right beside me, Daniel Washington, who is a bass baritone, tenure professor of music voice at the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance, and an honorary professor of the humanities at the University of Cape Town, South Africa College of Music. His career has taken him to the world's major opera houses and concert stages, including the Royal Opera House Covent Garden, the Hamburg State Opera, which we'll talk about later, the Zurich Opera, the Berlin Philharmonic, and the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. He has performed the roles of Porgy and Crown in the opera Porgy and Bess, 
all over the world. So we've got some people that are coming at this piece from lots of different angles, and we're gonna just jump right in. Elizabeth, I'm gonna start with you, and I'll give you a few minutes to just talk about, um, about the novel, Porgy, and some of your thoughts on that and having worked on exploring that aspect of the opera, because we talk a lot about the opera, but not so much about the, the novel. Well, as you heard from, thank you so much for coming out today to hear us. As you heard from the introduction, I am a librarian. So for me, I wanted to go straight to the source. Where, what was Gershwin looking at? What was he reading? And why did he choose this novel? My goodness, I have to say that I had the same reaction that he did upon hearing that he read it straight through the night. I did the same. I have to say that for what I had expected going in, I had no idea of how powerful this novel would be. DuBose Howard Hayward really was able to capture a moment in time and some of the things that I discovered through reading the novel opened a window into a world that honestly, I believe only he could have done. I, in reading about his life, he lost his father at the age of two. By 14, he had had to drop out of school and work in a hardware store. By 17, he was working on the wharves with many of the black stevedores that are depicted in the book. And so by that, being able to experience that, he was able to collect those dialects that are so important in understanding Gullah culture in South Carolina. And I do believe that that is, when I think about now hearing the opera, I find myself thinking, you know, Gershwin was the heart of the piece, but DuBose was the soul. There is something very poignant about the way that he depicts the characters I find them to be very thoughtfully portrayed. The issues about racial injustice are, are more subtly depicted in the novel, and I think that it really does portray just a, this era that was very difficult. You know, it, you know, people were coming out of what was the depression, the economic depression at following the Civil War. And so people, the ways that they had to earn livings, the way that life was in the South, in areas, my family's from New Orleans, so hurricanes are real and they're true, and the way that the hurricane was depicted in the book rings so true as well, because, you know, there, it's hard to explain unless you've experienced it, and so, because Hayward grew up in that area, he knew what that meant to a community and how it could evoke fear and just terror just at the thought of, you know, one coming close to, you know, your area or your region. And so as I began to think more about when, um, when Gershwin came to visit after he had read the novel, there's something that I thought about as well, and I've, I've been blessed in my life to know and work with many musicians, one of whom was the artist Prince. And what I can say about those particular folks that I consider to be musical geniuses is that perhaps they're not always innovators, but they're synthesizers. And there's a passage that I read that I wanted to just read about how Gershwin, when he went down there to South Carolina, what he was really fascinated with. And so it says, his fascination with African American music during that trip even led him into a shouting contest. Now shouting isn't shouting in the traditional sense. It's like, um, we call it ham bone in New Orleans, but it's when you're using your hands and your feet in, in a rhythmic pattern. And so, they said he was, it was said that he outshouted the best of the black folks there. A story that Ann Brown, the original best, well remembers. 
In an interview, she reminisced how one old man had remarked, you sure can beat out those rhythms, boy. I'm over 70 years old and I ain't see, never seen no poor little white man take off and fly like you. You could be my own son. And I think that that for me really captured what this incredible fusion between the authenticity of what Hayward had written with someone who was trying to fuse together the different sounds that he had grown up with, that he had learned, and that he was trying to discover more about. I think curious souls have a way of bringing together things that otherwise are very difficult to do. And so I think that that was what I, I came away with after reading Porgy and reading about Gershwin and his process down there visiting South Carolina. What, did, what, what the two of them were able to create I think was a little bit of magic. Thank you so much. <laughs> awesome, I'm just gonna keep moving down the line here. Naomi, if you can, um, that was a, a very um, inspiring. I'm gonna leave you now to talk a little bit more about your frustrations with the work. Um, we're just gonna dive right in, so. <laughs> sure. Thank you. So I'm going to speak honestly about Porgy and Bess because it's been a work I've been thinking a lot about. I've written about Porgy and Bess, and I'm also in the Willis Patterson Our Own Thing Chorale, which is the community choir that focuses on African American art song and is an interracial choir, but is primarily African American. And we're going to be the older, um, mainly people of color, uh, older people of color, up on stage on Saturday night. So I've been in the performance a lot. We just got out, you know, after 11 last night, and we've been rehearsing. And so I've known the opera really well, and as Wayne Shirley has said, it really feels very comfortable with what I've known, but it's, there's just nothing like being in it. And that's something I can give you if anyone has questions and about sort of specific things. But getting more to sort of loving and being frustrated with Porgy and Bess, what I've noticed, and just very quickly we can get into conversations about this later, in doing the research and writing about Porgy and Bess and looking at race and gender and cultural politics and what does it mean to perform this work in 2018 and beyond, is three main questions seem to emerge. One, what is Porgy and Bess? Is it an opera? Is it a musical theater piece? You know, what is the genre? And I think now for, um, hopefully most people will accept it as an opera. Gershwin called it a folk opera. It's been called an Amer the great American opera. And you, it really helps with opera singers <laughs> to sing and perform it. It's hard work. It's written for a full orchestra. And as you know, that weird thing of being an opera scholar, it feels like an opera, just the way the dramatic pacing, the recurrence of melodies and, and how the drama unfolds. So I think maybe that has been, um, at least we've got really compelling evidence to say absolutely call it an opera. Another question was, what is the full score? And I think we're um, fixing this with the critical edition. But the third question is, is it racist or not? And I'll just say a couple of words about this because I find, one, that's not a helpful question. It's, it's just something where, oh my goodness, there are terrible stereotypes in there. The, um, the dialect is, is frustrating. The um, portrayal of African Americans, it feels horrible. I sit there and I feel uncomfortable at times. I, don't, I can't speak for other folks except the people I've spoken to and that is something I've seen cross-racially. And people are really afraid to talk about that because it's also an incredible work which has withstood the, the time, the, the test of time. As we see sort of peppered throughout this um, symposium that Mark and Jessica have done a phenomenal job of organizing to really ask questions about this work. This is a work that has been embraced by many communities. People have been doing covers of Summertime, of It Ain't Necessarily So. Most people who have grown up in the United States and I dare say other places know parts of Porgy and Bess. So we can't censor and excise this piece, at least in my opinion. Maybe, and 
Actually, there are some people who feel it's just really offensive and painful. And I want to give just that space that there are some very problematic things in the opera. How do we perform it? We have symposiums like this. We have program notes that contextualize it. And we say, how do we handle this? This is a legacy we have all, in the United States especially, that we all live with. We have problems. We have not solved these problems. So I think we should continue doing Porgy and Bess, but to be thoughtful about it. And I think that's all the time. We have so many other perspectives, and there'll be questions and answers. Thank you very much. <laughs> so actually, Angela, it'd probably be good if you just kind of went off of that and um, speak specifically about working with your students on these posters and their entire, the course that you taught. Absolutely. Uh, if I had a theme for my initial contributions to today's discussions, it would definitely be, I got plenty of issues. <laughs> uh, almost two years ago, when the then dean of the School of Music, Theater, and Dance, Aaron Dworkin, told me of his plans um, to help bring a concert performance of Porgy and Bess to campus, my initial reaction was, don't, please don't. <laughs> Uh, we were in the midst of another contentious round of protests and struggles over race, racism, and representation, uh, the challenges of diversity and inclusion and equity, and I really felt that now is not the time to expend the resources, financial, human, intellectual, artistic, on something bound to raise alarms and anxieties. I've come around a bit. <laughs> I've never loved Porgy and have long found it unsettling in ways I still struggle to fully articulate. But I wanted to help Aaron and Mark Clegg and other colleagues to do this well and to provide a context in which we could all air our concerns and grievances and perspectives and loves uh, in a way that advances the educational mission of our institution. So I decided to teach a course in LSA's Applied Liberal Arts Division, Debating Porgy and Bess, drawing on perspectives from the humanities and critical theory performance studies with a little dollop of musicology thrown in with the help of some of my friends. <laughs> Mark and Naomi both visited the class and talked with students about the broader context of race and opera and the work of George and Ira Gershwin. Jessica Getman brought in a fascinating collection of musical stores and talked about the work of the Institute. And it was really fascinating to watch the students kind of interact with these materials. The course was framed around four main assertions. Assertion one, Porgy and Bess must be understood in historical context. There is no one Porgy and Bess, cultural critic Margot Jefferson wrote in 1988. It changes according to our perceptions, most obviously about race, but also about working class versus middle class Negro life, about gender representations and eros, addiction and religion. Most importantly, Porgy and Bess has changed because history has made it change, and it has made us change too, end quote. We talked about the ways in which Porgy and Bess has continued and continues to evolve in the years since she wrote those words. Mm -hmm. Assertion two, Porgy and Bess must be understood in its artistic context. Assertion three, <laughs> Porgy and Bess is an act of cultural appropriation and misrepresentation. Just the same James Baldwin muses in his 1959 review of Otto Premature's film, it is a white man's vision of Negro life. We debated whether it's just an extension of 19th century menstrual traditions, another example of what cultural theorist Eric Lott calls at once an act of love or desire and an act of theft across racial and class lines, just a, thrown stro a stone's throw, really, from Elvis Presley's hips or Miley Cyrus's twerk. And we skimmed the depths of high speculative theory with assertion four. Porgy and Bess can, should, has been redeemed, reclaimed by African American artists and audiences. Can you reclaim, revalue, transform what has been taken? We listened to Susan Laurie Parks talk about the recent Broadway production, looked at some of the same issues and questions around performance, other shows like Miss Saigon, which is a really fascinating comparison. West Side Story would be the third in the space. Um, and listen to Gil Evans's and Miles Davis's stirring rendition of I Loves You Porgy, which we'll hear too later this afternoon via UM Jazz Bands, which includes one of the students in the class, Andrew Grossman. You can see some of where my students ended up and what they made of all of this and the posters on display here. 
They worked in five teams and were required to make and defend a firm argument about the production. Maybe some of them will tell you what they really think and whether they changed their minds, which was one of the educational principles we discussed early on. It's okay to have a position. It's also okay to change your mind. And maybe, just maybe, I'll tell you what I think too. Thank you. <laughs> oh, let me, uh, uh, so some of my students are here. We actually meet later in the afternoon on Friday, so some of them will actually be here um, in, in the afternoon sessions, but some of them are in the audience today. Can you guys stand up and wave? Stand up. We had 23 students in all in the class, um, lots of materials, lots of visitors, and please do take a minute to, to look at what is part of their final project. The last thing that they'll do is to just write a short piece telling me what they actually think. <laughs> Thank you so much, Angela. Uh, go ahead, Mark. Please. Thanks, Willie. And I just wanted to thank all my colleagues up here just for all their help in pulling this together. I think I ran into Aaron immediately after he talked to you. <laughs> because um, he seemed pan rather panicked by what we were planning. And, uh, but it's this conversation, I think, that really is you know, part of the reclaiming of this opera for the community as a whole. Um, you know, my own relationship with the piece is I've just heard these melodies forever, and I've, there's something that just, I think like Naomi said, there's something that just feels spiritually rewarding about this piece. I mean, if you've, if you've lived with it. And I think when you hear the performance um, on Saturday, it's it's amazing the sort of resonance and the kind of emotional depth to the music, which at least for me gets beyond the sort of stereotypes and a lot of where these things come from, a little bit like the novel you were talking about, Elizabeth. I mean, the novel to me, I mean, it was a bit of a revelation. I, I taught a class, a seminar, a research seminar with um, doctoral students last fall, and you'll be hearing from them this afternoon and tomorrow at our sessions. And, uh, you know, it was, it was amazing to dig deeper, and the, the deeper we dug, the more it seemed human and the less it seemed about any one people, but it was always in that context. And I think, so it's been sort of a, a guilty love affair in some ways for me, um, you know, being the white guy running the, the Gershwin project. I mean, I'd say when, when Todd emailed us in 2008, you know, Obama had just been elected, it didn't feel that scary. Um, hardly that racism was cured, but it didn't feel like something that was gonna let the campus on fire. You know, um, I've been worried since then, um, especially the past year. And uh, just because there's so much violence being done to our students of color on campus, our you know, um, humans of color around the world. Um, you know, and I think that's one of the things that struck me about the opera, especially as we got in deeper with it, is how much of it remains current. I mean, I, I wish it was a nostalgia piece about the past, a past we had overcome, and we sort of looked at, at it as a kind of morality tale to remind us you know, that this is a place we don't want to be. Um, it's not that. It's the theme of our Martin Luther King celebration this year has been the urgency of now. And often when I'm thinking and watching this production, those words come back to my mind. And it's, and it's not just the racial issue. It's that, as Angela um, just mentioned, it's a gender issue, it's a sexual violence issue, it's a drug addiction issue. It's a natural disaster issue. I mean, there's this hurricane. We've had a few hurricanes in the last few eight months. And you know, the racial divide, I, I did some of my early work on a bandmaster from the Virgin Islands. And you know, we're talking about Puerto Rico and sort of the inequality of the kind of relief efforts there. They still don't have power, you know, um, still don't have housing. Food is still in sharp supply, but we don't talk at all about the Virgin Islands hardly, and that community is 85% African American. You know, so the Latino community in Puerto Rico has, and the Virgin Islands have not received the same kind of support that Houston got or that Florida got, and that's not an accident, I don't think. So, all of these things coming up, and, and then you see there are five white characters in Portuguese Bass. We we think about it as an all African American cast, but in fact there's there are two policemen, a, a detective, Archdale and a corner. And particularly the detective um, comes in and, and uh, you know, there's a silence that's, that's enforced on the community whenever one of the white characters walks on stage. You, you don't f experience it quite as much in the concert version as you do in the opera, um, but you know, the, the kind of, of killings that have happened in the United States in the last four or five years, you know, it's just, 
and you know, we sort of have a kind of citizen activism because of cell phones and videos. We're seeing things that we didn't get to see before. But Gershwin and the Haywards showed us this in 1935. Um, so the, the white characters sing in a kind of uh, what's called Sprechstimme. So it's sort of a spoken, very modern um, approach that's associated more with Schoenberg than, than Gershwin. And I think that's one of the interesting things about this opera. It really is a modern opera. It's based as much on Alpenberg's Wozzeck as it is on Puccini. Um, so there's, we tend to think of, I think, Gershwin as a, as a very popular composer, as a melodist, as a sort of traditional composer, because he now defines the tradition of what it means to be a popular songwriter, to be a Broadway composer. But in his era, he's really interested in advancing musical discourse. And you'll hear that um, in the, the show tomorrow night. So it's, for me, it's very contemporary. And the problem with, with Porgy and Bess is really, in some ways, um, its solution. It's, it's to continue talking about, to engage with these kind of symposia with and struggling with it, struggling with how we feel about it, with what it tells us, trying to get to the nuance of what's in the book, what's in the play, getting beyond the sort of you know, black-white dialectic on a, on a kind of surface scale and digging into the nuance of these human characters, the way they're based in these stereotypes, and trying to resolve the tension um, among those issues, I think, is where we start to get the nuance that we need today to, to understand each other a little better and to get past this kind of gridlock in our political system. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's been interesting hearing everyone else's point of view about Porgy and Bess. Um, and I'm supposed to talk about it as a performer. Uh, and I will, but I, there's, Within that, there are a lot of other things that are interwoven. So the, f the first thing I'd like to say is that um, it is an opera. Um, there's no doubt about that. The challenges, the vocal challenges that, that occur in this piece are the same vocal challenges that I've uh, addressed when I've sung Wagner or Mozart or Verdi. So it is definitely an opera. Um, it is also, uh, as Naomi said, it's, it's an, a, a grand opera which has everything in it that you expect of a grand opera. There's love, there's hate, there's death, there's triumph. Um, and Porgy and Bess fits that bill in more ways than one. Um, I'm originally from Somerville, South Carolina, which is about 20 miles from Charleston. So I've been kind of involved with Porgy and Bess one way or another all my life. I even sang the Bess You Is My Woman duet as a high school senior, way before I should have, but um, <laughs> I sang it as a high school senior. So I've, I've, I've known about the piece and respect of the piece for, for a long time. The thing that, that is troubling to, to all of us is um, how do you deal with something that, that is purported to show your life and your community and I struggled with that as well for a long time. Um, and I didn't do Porgy and Bess for a long time. Part of that was because I wasn't vocally ready to do it. And part of that was because I was trying to establish myself as, a, as a, uh, an opera singer who could sing all genres of music and not just be relegated to, to the wonderfulness that, that is Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. So as you train to learn to sing in Italian, German, French, Russian, as you train to learn to sing Schubert and Verdi and Mozart and Beethoven, you also must eventually become such a, a well-rounded musician and singer that you can do any genre, any style, and that includes Gershwin. So I came to it uh, probably later than most singers, and I've been involved with productions from the, uh, what I think is probably the, the gold standard of productions, the Houston Grand Albert production, um, as a, child, uh, to uh, a, a production in Paris a, a few years ago that was totally modern and had, we had four white walls, that was our set. Four white walls and one long white table with white chairs, that was it. So it's hard to imagine uh, Charleston, South Carolina with white walls and if any of you have ever been to Charleston, you know that that's not, that's not what Charleston looks like. Um, but the thing that I have realized in, in singing Porgy and Bess uh, all over the world and in different venues and different sets with different uh, conductors and stage directors' points of view is that it is 
more than anything else, a community. It's a community of people. It's a community of people that care about each other. It's a community of people that has good, bad, lots of in-between in it. And the thing that, that, that I always have, that I have always found uh, that's important, including the, the, what it does musically, is that every man in the community has a job. He may be selling honey, he may be selling crabs, he may be on Jake's boat. Jake, by, by the way, has his own boat. He's a businessman. Mariah has her shop. She's a businesswoman. Um, except for uh, Porgy, except for Crown and Bess and Porgy, until she gets a divorce. All the couples are married. They have children. They represent a family. They represent a community. So when, when you look at that, you, you see, wow, this is really rather positive. Um, there is a drug dealer in the community, which isn't so positive, but that's true of most communities. There's somebody that sells something that's illicit in most communities. I don't care what color you are. So the universality of what Gershwin wrote is the thing that always strikes me. Um, even after struggling with the racism. And, and like Mark, I'm often troubled by the fact that the black community's relationship with the police is not much different today than it was when the opera was written. And that's incredibly troubling. And it should be troubling to all of us. Uh, the, the hue of our skin shouldn't make that uh, an issue that only one community deals with. So having performed it all over the world and having sung it in a way and having been challenged by it vocally, I can tell you that it's a, it's a wonderful piece and uh, I've sung Crown and Porgy. So I've been on my knees and in love with Bess and I've been standing up and being a man and treating Bess horribly. Um, I've had to kill a man in the first scene and be killed later in the opera. Uh, <laughs> So it's, it's, it's very challenging, and it's, and it's an interesting point of view. The nobility that Porgy has is incredible. Um, but the fact that Crown, as reprehensible as he is, would go out in the middle of a hurricane and try to save Clara. So it, it speaks to me of, of, of a piece that is strong and vibrant and timeless. And if you've ever, and I hope you've seen it more than once, and if you get the, a chance to see it on, on Saturday, you will enjoy it because it's a thrilling piece. Great, let's engage in some conversation now. Um, I wanna present something, a quote to you all, an idea, and then have you all respond to that, um, or some of you all, not, not everyone needs to. Um, is this idea of um, white paternalism. Um, so this is a quote from Harold Cruz, who was a professor here at the University of Michigan in the 1960s in that area. Um, and he argued that the work must be criticized from the Negro point of view as the most perfect symbol of the Negro creative artist's cultural denial, degradation, exclusion, exploitation, and acceptance of white paternalism. Any reactions to that? <laughs> well, I had to work with Dr. Cruz when he was here. He was our chair of our department. Well, it wasn't a department at that point, it was the center, and he was our first chair. I mean, so he was an amazing man, but he was also a very angry man. And I think that it was rightfully so. I, exactly, there was a lot of a lot of what he says in that quote is true. I mean, when you're only seeing through one lens, the kaleidoscope that is black culture, it makes it very difficult to make sense of having such a popular opera be performed and people around the world seeing only that lens. So I think that what he said 
it makes perfect sense, and it makes even more perfect sense that it would come from him who wrote The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. I think it's, it's important for us to remember and I think that some of the points that Daniel brought up and Mark and Angela and Naomi, each of them spoke about these issues and how it's critical that we look at it from all those different angles in order to understand that the challenges that we face as a society, I think that's why it resonates so much for me because it's showing us there's a lot we have yet to do and what's left to be done is still undone. And I think, you know, Harold Cruz is a really important cultural critic, you know, a really important black intellectual, paved the way for a lot of us, um, you know, and so we have a really interesting relationship to him and his work. Um, I think, you know, where he's sort of looking at white paternalism, I think, you know, now, you know, we would say, you know, with anger, with not, for me, not with, you know, you know a particular, you know, a, a large amount of anger, that, you know, I think the, the part of what I think we see in Porgy and Bess and other works like it is that it, 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 it instantiates um, white supremacy, yep. right? It, it instantiates whiteness itself systemically, right? I mean, it really lets a lot of people off the hook, right? I mean, I think in, you know, in, in, in some really powerful racial ways that, you know, I think we should be attentive to, that we should care about, you know I mean? That we could still go to the production and enjoy it, um, but then to kind of step back and ask some real criti critical questions about it, right? I mean, or again, you know, that Baldwin quote that, you know, this is a white person's view of black life, right? And, and what that might really mean, especially when you leave the theater, right? So with the last scenes, with, you know, it's a stirring music, kind of bl black people are relatively happy. I mean, but this is a really disturbing vision, I think, in a lot of ways, right? And kind of what people take away from this, you know, as they leave the theater, I think it's really worth, you know, having some serious conversations about, you know, really openly and really frankly, at a moment where we're really starting to care a lot about issues like whiteness and like cultural equity, which I think now is, you know, when you look back at Cruz's work, I think he's also talking about that, you know, where's the equity, right? And so in this moment where we're trying to take seriously claims about diversity, equity, and inclusion, that means we have to change, right? That, that something has to change. Something has to be transformed. More space has to be opened up. More critiques have to happen, right? And then we have to be able to, to listen and to hear that and maybe change some of the things that we think or do um, and, and perform. I'd like to just jump in super quickly with um, that quote and this issue of paternalism, my world has changed these past few days as I've been spending so many hours on the stage, behind everything, you know, in the chorus. And there's, it, it has come up before, I had um, the character of Archibald and how he's sort of the one nice white character who's in there trying to say, hey, Porgy, wanna let you know that I've done what I can to get Peter out of prison, and yet, when he comes on stage, being in my skin, being in the chorus, I, I look at him and I'm, and the, because they're all like, yes, boss, okay, they don't know who he is, and he's saying, you know, do you know where Porg is, Porg is, and they're like, mm, I don't know. And then when he finally is able to convince them, I'm not here to hurt you, then they say, oh, okay, Porg, and they get him. But he expects to come in with his benevolence, he says he's owned Peter's family before, or maybe it's Porgy's family, Peter's family, and there's this really weird feeling, like even in a, a benevolent sense, there's this paternalistic feeling where you're coming here, you expect to be accepted, and yet it, we are all feeling a little nervous about you. We don't know who you are, and, and yeah, so I just wanted to mention that. And if I could jump in quickly, the paternalism that, that exists has to do with the fact that, that the, the advances of composers of color has not been part of the canon. Yeah, as, as, and as long as, we let, uh, as long as we let white composers represent other cultures, that's what's gonna happen. Until we accept the fact that we need to educate everyone about what has occurred, we're gonna be in this situation of paternalism. And you will get a white person's representation of uh, Japan, 
just look at Butterfly or Turandot. Um, so uh, un until we embrace everything that is all that we all are, until we embrace the fact that the history of the United States is could not be really told without the contributions of African Americans. And until that is taught in the schools, until that's taught in the hallowed halls of the University of Michigan, we will have this paternalism. Yeah. What an excellent point. I, I just want to say that's something that Prince grappled with too. He was working on an opera. We were working on a piece about Katrina. And he was very, very conscious of Porgy and Bess, I swear I must have heard Summertime like 30,000 times <laughs> because he had his Oscar. He won one for Purple Rain and, and so he was very accomplished and played over 26 instruments. But in capturing the sense of the opera, he said, it's so much the white man's eyes that I have to try to look through because they're that audience. He said, I don't want to go there. And so In the Vault is a piece that is very, I, I love it, but it's very strange. And it's, it's jazz infused because his father was a pure jazz musician. And he felt that there was a place that there could be a jazz opera. But he was really grappling with how to break through that wall of what opera meant to our society and whiteness in particular. So going along those lines, just thinking about George Gershwin when he was writing and also about black Americans where they've seen success in music generally has been largely in two areas, jazz and hip hop. And what we see in, in both those areas is we have a certain level, not just performers, but producers, composers, all of that sort of thing. Whereas when we're speaking about Porgy and Bess as an opera, or even if we were speaking about it as a musical, blacks have not had that kind of um, <clears throat> presence, mostly as performers, of work written for them, or you know, like when you go to the symphony, most of the time, or if you were to go to see a performance of Porgy and Bess like we will here, you will most of the time see a white conductor conducting Porgy and Bess, and the two most important people at a concert, classical music concert, are the composer and the conductor. So can you speak a little bit, someone speak a little bit about this idea of, of Porgy and Bess representing that as opera is a Western, you know, European art form formed. Uh, speak a little bit about what I just spoke about is the lack of ownership of black Americans in that classical music space and also the theatrical space? I love this question and I'll jump in really quickly <laughs> because I'm involved in a bunch of work that's reclaiming an African American voice in American music historiography. Putting American music on the map has been a heroic feat that this university has done really well with. Yet frequently, in a discussion of what is American for music, you know, and coming at the end of the 19th century where we're not just focusing on Europe, but coming up with our own indigenous voice, we've had a very strong, wonderful um, energy of African American composers, primarily in jazz, blues, ragtime, many different styles of jazz from um, Dixieland, swing, progressive, um, disco, so we have this large continual loop of black performers and importance in an entertainment style and not necessarily in what's considered the classical art music. Luckily, this is not the only story and right now there is a new energy in looking at black composers and we have dissertations coming out of this university that's looking at Harry Lawrence Freeman, we have Austin Stewart, and being advised by Mark Clegg. We have operas by black composers. I used to think, just like with women composers, oh, there are none. Oh, well, that's too bad. It must be institutional issues. And it turns out there are some. And they're writing operas for Denver, or they're writing operas in New Orleans, or they're, you know, it's not just necessarily New York. So a really, all of this is to say, 
changing the historiography and the landscape, the sonic landscape that we have is, it, it's, it's afoot, it's happening, and it, it's really exciting. Just also want to point out we have a book by Naomi Andre, her second on blackness and opera coming out. So we have a scholarship all around the campus <laughs> contributing to this problem. But I would, you know, it's, it's, I think it's undeniable that our, you know, opera houses and concert halls or symphony institutions are racist, at least in the way that they present material. I mean, I can't say that, Mark. I'm glad you did. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, it, I don't think it's necessarily conscious. It's institutional, but as a music school, and I would say our music school is guilty of this to a, an unfortunate extent, is that we, as, you know, we see ourselves as the perpetuators of the tradition. We don't often enough question whether that tradition is accurate or complete. Um, if you think about, yeah, if you think about opera, I mean, we have Harry Lawrence Freeman, we have um, Scott Joplin, we have James P. Johnson, they all wrote operas prior to Porgy and Bess. You know, but they didn't get the kind of institutional support, and because of Gershwin's fame, he be, you know, was able to create this, this show, and it became really famous. Um, and I, you know, I think Gershwin and, and the Haywards had a lot of white privilege, but I would just point out with the Gershwins is that they're not entirely white in the way we think of it today, because they're Jewish. And we had a quota of how many people we would allow in here. We had boats of refugees coming to our shores. We wouldn't let them in. We sent them back to Europe. Many of them, for that reason, died during the Holocaust. You know, we don't have a great record on anti-Semitism, and we don't have a great record on African-American racism. You know, there's, or Latino inclusion, a Asian Americans in the South, we put them in concentration camps during World War II. There's a lot of embarrassing racial history to America, and we don't talk about it a whole lot, at least not enough. I mean, and, and I think that's, that starts with sort of, you know, in, even in elementary school, it comes forward. So it, it's, we have to change that canon by intentionally reaching back to rediscover these works and then putting them on normal subscription concerts with a lot of rehearsal time. Right now, they get relegated to Black History Month concerts, and they don't get the rehearsal time, and everybody thinks, oh, well, that's cute. You know, it doesn't sound as good as Beethoven. Well, they've been playing Beethoven for 200 years. They're, they really know how that goes. Right? So, you know, we've got to consciously change this, and it's not going to happen naturally. It's got to happen intentionally. I I you know, I do really, really quick. I mean, I think really what's been nice about working with Mark and other colleagues at the, the, the School of Music, Theater, and Dance is that we started talking about this stuff early on, you know, about issues of cultural equity, that, you know, we were about to expend resources on this, which means that we weren't going to be doing other kinds of things. Um, and to be really conscious about the ways that we can open up the space more, look at a larger range of musics and performers. And so I think that's been really nice that when we started thinking about what what's going to be happening today and tomorrow, that, that that was part of the conversation. And I really gave them a, a lot of credit for having that conversation. Thank you. I'm going to ask one last question before I turn it over. I wish we had more time. Um, the Gershwins stipulated that this opera would never be performed in any iteration, whether it be um, an opera or musical um, piece, that that only black Amer blacks, I, sh I, I keep saying, I don't want to say African Americans because everyone that's black is not African American, um, that only blacks were to play these roles, especially in the lead roles. Um, there, I think there's different rules as far as a concert staging because there'll be white people on stage if you're going to be shocked, now you know. Um, in any event, uh, and what that did was make a lot of people employable over a long period of time, um, even now, but specifically at the time it was written up and through, you know, through the civil rights uh, era and past that. And I just ask the question, and if you all could each answer this very briefly, please, very briefly, <laughs> I want to ask questions. Does that aspect of giving these performers who otherwise would have had no other way of starting a career having one? We look at Willard. Uh, uh, we look at um, William Warfield and Leontine Price and the legendary tour that they did, and that started her off. Wayne was talking about Trovatore this morning, and the first thing I thought about with Leontine Price was not that she played Bess in 1955, but her Trovatore at the Metropolitan Opera ten years later. So, did that override 
all of the other things, George Gershwin and Ira Gershwin and DuBose Hayward and Dorothy Hayward, um, basically culturally appropriating uh, black life at a time when black Americans were not able to speak for themselves. I don't know if it overrided all of that, but it certainly gave uh, many, many, many black performers the opportunity to uh, showcase their talent in a way that they weren't able to do otherwise. Thank you. That's brief. <laughs> There's more to say. <laughs> I'm gonna answer this by referring to Rich Crawford, who's writing a book on George Gershwin right now, but he came to my class uh, last fall, and one of the things he pointed out was that he believed that George Gershwin had a, a deep and sincere appreciation for the talent, the black talent that was in New York and on Broadway, and that was the great singers that were there that he wanted to give, bring to the fore. And th that that was something he felt very deeply. I think I'll just say, um, I was really impressed by being schooled on this question by um, you know, a long string of, of uh, uh, black performers who have performed in the opera and played these roles. And listening to their experiences and their reflections, and I think I can speak for some of my students, one of the first things we did in the class is to just watch a wonderful documentary with people just talking about that, you know, just, just talking about their stories and their, their conflicted relationship to what they were doing. That yes, this was paving the road maybe to something else, but oh, it was trapping them in something that they were uncomfortable with. And how do you deal with a dialect question, which I just felt like, oh God, that's got to be painful. Um, and I think that that was a really good place to start the class. And I mean, I think that that's a good thing to do, to, to just read their voices and understand their experience and the rich complexity of, of what it must be like to you know, be on stage performing in Porgy and Bess. Nowhere else in the opera canon do we get so many black bodies on stage, and that is an amazing, incredible thing. And to not a surprise, when you go to a performance of Porgy and Bess, you also have black bodies in the audience. That is wonderful. A very frustrating and angry thing I feel is that opera companies do not show the loyalty, the commitment to these singers. Once they sing in Porgy and Bess, there's frequently a revolving door when they go out, and that is not fair. I guess I was just thinking about how Porgy and Bess really, um, what you were saying, Angela, about the dialect and things, I think part of that has to do with the classism that we have within America, too, because when I think about who I consider to be the queen of African-American literature, Zora Neale Hurston, she wrote in dialect, and I loved it then, and I love it in here. So, you know, I think that there's something to be said about people being forced to perform it. The folks who were singing it were not of the same class and had taken classical training, so there would be a conflict. It was difficult for me to read it, but it's something that when I go home in New Orleans and I'm down in Treme, people are still speaking this way. So we can't um, avoid talking about these difficult issues. And I think that that's something that, you know, black culture has to address. We have to talk about all the ways that we are and what that means for America, accepting us for who we are. And I think with this play, I think, I mean, with this opera, I think of, you know, something popped in my head when I read that cap, you know, that point about it being an all black cast, I was like, wow, this may have been, just for me, an example of Black Lives Matter. Thank you all so much. Okay, so I, I lied. The bulk of our time won't be spent with questions for you, sorry. Um, we should have had more time here. Um, so I do want to take a few questions. Um, let's go ahead, uh, who's passing the mic, Jessica? We need to get one of these down, I think. Okay. Uh, Thanks. Uh, three quick points. One, Archibald might be George Gershwin, his self-portrait as like the nice white guy coming in and telling a story about the black community and how it may be taken. Uh, two, the reason why there's an issue of whether this is an opera or a musical piece um, is that 
you know, Mozart writes an aria. It doesn't become a jazz standard that has a, and the melodies itself aren't like played out of context from the opera as a whole, the way that the, the music of Poirier and Bess is. So we, we have to get to lunch at 12.30. So um, if anyone, ha do any of the students have a question that they want to ask? Does anyone have a comment on that? I'll talk right with here. you personally. Jessica. Yeah, I just want to hear what you guys have to say about, because uh, we've had a lot of talking about, of course, the racial importance of the show, but I also want to hear what you guys have to say about gender representation, because uh, I was researching Bess a lot um, for our project, and I just, I, I find her to be very controversial as a character and not the best portrayal of African-American women, but also not an untypical a portrayal. Um, so I just sort of wanted to hear your guys' comments on that and how that might be improved in the future. Um, yeah. One thing I love about Bess's character is that she stems so deeply from a minstrel stereotype, the Jezebel, and then evolves. So you actually end up caring about her. She's not just the sexy hussy who wants to have sex with everyone, but she's somebody who feels the love of the community, feel, gets connected with Porgy, and throughout the opera, she actually undergoes an evolution. So just a quick response to that, I think Bess is a complicated character, and that's what opera is about. It's not just a vaudeville, like two-dimensional, not that all vaudeville is two-dimensional by any means, but that she's not just fulfilling a stereotype, but she has stereotype elements, and then she sort of develops and changes. So that makes me feel, I, I can love Bess along with Porgy. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you all so much. I hate to cut this short because I just wanted to say something. I wanted to ask Angela a question about the fact that Bess is not the only woman in the opera and do the other women in the opera help to show different facets of that because I think Bess gets a bad rap for being the representation of black women, but there are lots of black women in the show. Um, in any event, uh, we have to wrap up. I'm sorry we don't have more time. Um, Jessica, where are we going to lunch? So what's happening now is if we've been able to get you into lunch, we are going directly over to the Michigan League. You want to walk out the front of